Great. Okay, well, I, I'm uh, Bill Buchanan, so I'll be taking the next few weeks. So our focus is on understanding cryptography. <laughs> it's probably one of the weakest areas in the industry, uh, and few people really understand the concepts involved with public key encryption, private secret key, and hashing. With GDPR coming up uh, in 2018, there's going to be a bit of a shock happening in the industry and the encryption will be at, at the fore of, of that. GDPR says that a company will be fined up to 4% of world turnover on, on a data breach. The times to report a data breach are reducing and companies only have a few days to, to report it uh, and there will be serious consequences which means anyone handling its data on European citizens must comply with the GDPR. So a key part of GDPR is, is encryption and the usage of, of encryption. So we're going to try and cover some of the fundamental areas. So today we hopefully we'll have a bit of fun in the lab with a few ciphers, a few of the old ciphers. Uh, but next week we'll go into more detail about what public key is, private key, uh, and so on, and really dive into the into the methods to see how they work, to see what the problems are. If somebody builds a quantum computer tomorrow, then the whole of the internet is is, is open. Uh, I think the first commercial quantum computer goes on sale in the next few weeks or so. So it's a scary time for uh, the internet in that you could actually breach the whole of the internet. Every single bit of data that was encrypted, everything that's tunneled, could actually be, be revealed. So we'll look at some of the, the key areas as part of that, as part of the key, uh, key, key exchange. And what we'll find is there's no magic <laughs> one solution, they're all used together. <laughs> Okay, when you connect to Google with HTTPS, you're connecting with public key to prove the identity of Google. You're connecting with private key with AES for the tunnel, and you're using a hashing method uh, for it, and also you're using a key exchange method to, to negotiate a key between you and Google. So we'll find they all merge together, and there's no one single thing that, uh, that, that works. And then we'll look at the horrendous disaster that's PKI or digital certificates, public key and destruction. Uh, really, we can't, we can't go on with PKI. It doesn't work, it doesn't scale into a new world. <clears throat> Few people understand what digital certificates are and what you do. And do you really trust a digital certificate? Uh, there's reckon that at least one of the major trust providers will have a significant breach, which means that a lot, of, a good part of the internet could be compromised uh, by, by that. Okay, so we'll look at uh, uh, digital certificates and, and PKI. So this is the main website that, uh, that, you, can, that you can go to for the, uh, for the material. And the first unit should be outlined uh, here. Okay, so, the, so each week we'll tell you exactly what you should be learning uh, and why. Uh, so we cover a lot of material, but there's only a few things that we're really going to assess you on. So make sure you, you learn, but you also target the things that we'll ask for, because they're going to build on to other things where they could be assessed. Okay, so there's a lab today, uh, and it's a Cypher lab. And if you're into Python, we've got a little additional lab. We won't assess you on it, but Python is a great tool to, to be able to muck about with crypto and, and to do things. So there's an additional lab there that, that you might want to have a look at. But you should find the, the presentation is there, and then there's a little tutorial at the end to get you thinking in the right way for a, for a postgraduate level. Does anybody have any questions about what we're going to cover? or anything like that before we start. Anybody? No? Good. Okay. So what we're going to do today is, is really give you an introduction, some of the fundamentals. There's not heavy maths in here. 
there's a little bit of arithmetic, there's a little bit of, uh, of calculation. Uh, RSA as we go on to, is it too difficult? <laughs> you don't get it, you don't get it, you don't get it. Ah, I get it. <laughs> okay, so bang your head against the wall for a little while, and eventually you'll actually get what the what it is actually uh, doing. It survived about 40 odd years, so it's doing well, uh, but it's kind of creaking at, at the seams to some extent. Okay, so we'll, we'll, we'll have a look at, uh, at some of the, some of the, uh, so, so to use some of the key, the key principles uh, involved. Uh, so base 64 is used extensively, uh, and what we do if we want to pass a key, we want to pass some cipher text, it's base 64 uh, that's there. So we need to understand that whole ones and zeros to the cipher text uh, and so on. Then we'll look at prime numbers uh, and see how they're used and how they're still used in a quantum called computing world. Uh, prime numbers. The factorization of prime numbers when you multiply them together isn't a difficult task for a quantum computer. So if a quantum computer gets built, that factorization, that really difficult task of taking two prime numbers and multiplying them and then to find them again is actually not a difficult task to do in a quantum computer. So we'll have a look at prime numbers and see what we do. And then we don't do with little bitty numbers. <laughs> 32 bits, small, 64 bits, and we deal with 2048 bits, we deal with massive, massive, massive numbers. So your normal programs where you've got int, don't really work, or are long, we use big numbers. And the great thing with Python is it couldn't care less if you're dealing with a big integer or a small integer, there's nothing fancy that you have to do, it can cope with uh, the large numbers that, that we can actually produce. Okay, so we'll see in the lab, if you're interested, we'll do some Python uh, on, on that. Then we'll look at random number generators, a uh, bit of uh, frequency analysis <coughs> for cracking some codes, and then we'll go on to some, some background about uh, key sizes. Okay, so this is, this is what we've got, <coughs> if we want to keep it kind of simple. Uh, the internet we created really isn't fit for purpose. Uh, all the protocols that we've set up are <laughs> insecure. Uh, so how do we fix that? How have we fixed that? What's the bandage? What's the sticking plaster that we used to fix this problem? Encryption. Uh, yeah, but what type, what, what's, what's, the, what's the protocol? What's the layer that we've added? What's the little sticking plaster that we've put in place? Oh. Password? Oh no, 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 no. In, in communications. SSL? SS what? SSL? SSL. SSL and TLS, <laughs> but it's still, it's still pretty bad. And it's our, it's our tunnel, it's a tunnel to the end to end. It's not a device to device at all, it's not a user to user. The internet is now going to be a connection of devices, services, you. <laughs> Uh, an SSL is just really to allow you to tunnel from one machine to another over the network. So it's a, it's a short term fix and it's really proved to be a bit of a disaster in terms of beast and drowned. Does anybody know any other, any other vulnerabilities that SSL has, has exposed, has been exposed to? Does it seem? Second term? Heartbleed. Heartbleed, yeah. So Heartbleed was caused not by SSL, but by the library that, that was used by, by uh, most of the, the internet. Uh, you can send a packet and it would reveal the memory, the running memory of the server, which isn't really very good because it's revealing passwords and things like that. Any other ones? Was the Poodle SSL? Poodle? Poodle? That, yeah. was a, that was forced from the downgrade. That was a downgrade attack. Yeah. So many of them, do you know what, do you know what happens with the downgrade attack? Uh, can I get <laughs> okay, that great attack was that, that uh, we'll come back on to it. Uh, this is military grade. This is the most evil thing in the world uh, in terms of law enforcement and so on. Encryption is like uh, it's equivalent to nuclear weapons in terms of its military grade. So when the original Netscape released the original SSL, 
uh, the U.S. government put a restriction uh, on the size of the keys, and a crazy size of the keys that, that wasn't too difficult. It could be cracked at the time, but these days you could probably crack it with a, with a mobile phone. So a downgrade attack is typically where you just ramp it back and you take the least, as we go into it, the least uh, encryption possible. So you still see MD5, we'll cover that. You still see, uh, uh, you still see uh, uh, DES, come back onto that. And uh, an intruder can push the crypto down to the very lowest level. When you're negotiating your connection, you say, I want MD5 and I want uh, uh, three DES and I don't want AES. So the angry the tank is pushing it right down to the to the bottom, so that a person can, uh, can can crack. So that's that's what we built, and it's really not not very good. So we've got a whole lot of new uh, protocols uh, coming along. So let's see, where am I on my slides there? Uh, Okay, so, so really, uh, that great tale has, has changed in 40 or 50 years. Uh, much of the work was done in, in the 70s, uh, and a lot of the core principles were developed by, by these, these guys here. So Whitfield Diffie, uh, as we'll see, created a key exchange method. So I can say something, I can pass some numbers, you can pass some numbers to me, and in the end, we magically end up with the same uh, number or the same secret key. And even though uh, we're being watched, it's not possible for somebody to actually see what the, what the encryption key is that we've, that we've created. He also, he also envisaged that we can have a trapdoor function. And a trapdoor function is that uh, perhaps Perhaps there's a magical way that we can create two keys. We can create a public key and a private key. If I encrypt with this one, then only this one can decrypt. So it was Whitfield Diffie that said that, <coughs> that maybe that, 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 that can happen. And then it was these guys here who really came up with the first method of that. And what method did they create? It's in the names. RSA. So they created RSA, and it's still around, and it's still used. Uh, an elliptic curve, uh, uh, Diffie-Hellman, <laughs> it's now been, been used. Elliptic curve methods are now being used, and since we're in the home of, uh, of Napier, uh, logarithms are, uh, discrete logarithms are, are at the key to, to, to many of the methods that we actually use. So they came up with that, and what an amazing thing that we can have that. But, my goodness, is it processor intensive? <laughs> so we don't really use this as our core encryption. That just wouldn't happen. Oh, did anybody know what we use this, this method for? <clears throat> We've not covered it yet, so I'm not expecting you to answer it. What is it? Where would we use it, do you think? Keys. Sir? To exchange keys. To exchange keys. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> in one application, yeah, yeah, uh, but there's a there's a bigger application for this authentication. Authentication, yeah. So we we normally sign with this private key. Okay, <laughs> this is this is a if we use a, if we use a Bitcoin, if we trade in Bitcoins, uh, we sign with a private key to say that this is my Bitcoin, this is my transaction, and then everybody can prove it. Slightly different than bit, Bitcoins. <laughs> Bitcoins is a bit of higgledy piggledy and blockchain. But uh, we proved to everybody that I'm me. If anybody knows who the genesis record of Bitcoin is, then please say. I think they found the eighth record. Yeah, he said he created Bitcoin. He reckoned he signed it. But they still have to find the original genesis Bitcoin uh, from, from there. So we'll find that that's used uh, to be able to, to, to sign a 
Okay, every single time that we connect to Google through HTTPS, and Google is forcing encryption. They're telling sites that really, if you don't put HTTPS on, then, uh, then we'll, we'll eventually kick you off our, our search network. We, and we won't, we won't see your site as, as, as well trusted. Uh, so Ron went on to, to create his hashing methods, as we'll find, uh, and his, his ciphers. If you see RC, anybody heard of RC? Uh, any others? RC4 is Ron Cipher. Ron Cipher. So that's uh, that's Ron there. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> so that's uh, that's Ron's uh, Cipher uh, there. Okay, RC, RC2, RC4, RC5, and so on. Ron Cipher. And he did the MD5, MD4, and MD2. Everybody remembers that one. <laughs> Phil Zimmerman. And nearly went to prison uh, for his beliefs uh, to protect privacy. So he said, isn't it crazy? I can send you an email. I sent you an email last night. And you have no idea if I've really sent that email. Uh, it says at the bottom, Bill. But can you really say that it was me? And it wasn't one of you that sent that uh, email? Can everybody say for definite that that was me? No. <laughs> because I didn't sign it. I didn't. So after all these years, we still haven't got to the point that we can actually trust any emails that we actually get. Phil created a system, do you remember what it's called? It's a pretty good system. Pretty good programs. Yeah. So he created PGP. Okay. So PGP is probably the only show in town in terms of uh, secure encryption. You'll still see some academics have got their, their public key on their website, uh, but they probably, I've, I've never received an email uh, with, using my <laughs> public key. But that's the proper way, that's the proper way uh, to do it. And then they had a competition. Uh, see, the old stuff isn't very good anymore. Let's actually look at the new stuff. So do you know where these guys are from? In the hotbed of uh, cryptography. Nearly. Nearly. Belgium. <laughs> In that hotbed, crypto, Belgium. And they created Rendal, made from the names, and it became AS. So there's a big competition. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of assessment that's done to that. And it was AS that was seen as the, as the, uh, the best one. And that, <coughs> it's, that's the one that's, that's most often used now. And then we have Bruce here, who you need to read his, uh, his blog. I read his book and I just it transformed my whole thinking about about life. Uh, so have a look at his his crypto book. It really is written so well and it's so inspiring. He has an attitude to things, which is good, and, and people tend to respond quickly to things. Uh, uh, but but it's always always interesting. So so make sure you have a little look uh, at, at that. Okay, so, so we're going to meet a team, and uh, uh, unfortunately we have Eve, so we need to understand Eve. We might be Eve, uh, uh, but we were more likely to understand Eve and, and try and see what Eve is actually doing. So we often we represent Eve as a clown. I don't know why we do it, but just, that's just our little icon. So there's a, there's a, there's a nice clown. Just scary kind. So uh, I'm trying to understand that. So there are some of the guys that uh, Bruce Snyder uh, introduced to the world. So we tell stories in cryptography about the people. Okay, it makes it a bit more human. So we're going to talk about Bob and Alice. Anybody any idea? Some of the other ones there. Chuck, yeah. So we've got Chuck. Just looking for you. that Chuck. <laughs> Chuck. Anyone else? Sybil. Sybil. <laughs> Sybil, well done. Where's Sybil? There. Well done. Anyone? Victor. Victor. Well done. Victor. <laughs> Victor. That's Craig from South Park. Who is it? Craig from South Park. Craig. Well done. Craig. That was really well spotted. <laughs> Anyone? 
I have no idea who she is. That's the only one I'm oh, aware yeah. Can anybody get that one? Can you get that one? David Bowie. David Bowie. David Bowie is one of the characters. Yeah, David. David as well. Sadly gone, unfortunately. Aladdin. 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 <laughs> Aladdin. Aladdin could be one of them, but uh, David is, is it. Okay. So there they are. Uh, so we've got Craig is the password cracker. Uh, Erwin is the fifth participant. Grace is the government representative. <laughs> Frank, you didn't get Frank, is the sixth participant. Dan or Dave or David uh, is a fourth participant. Sybil is an attacker who marshals a large number of pseudonyms. Wendy's a whistleblower. Peggy, sorry about that. This is Peggy. <laughs> uh, so Peggy is a prover and so on. So in cryptography, we tell stories about Bob and Alice uh, and Eve. So Bob and Alice are the two people communicating. Eve is the hacker. Uh, we, all, we get all these other ones that I took on to. And uh, so I, I don't know how you feel about when you go to Starbucks and they ask you your name. You know, <laughs> I'm not going to tell you my name. So I've been trying to get them all. So I did Walton and I did that. Uh, I got my name is Bubbleys. Bubbleys. <laughs> so all, all these are sourced from your local coffee store. So, uh, so I did the uh, Bubbleys. I thought I really did. I did well. I did, I did Carol. It's Carol with a C. My name is Carol. And the guy looked at me. That's strange. He put it Carol with a K. He must have thought I was some Eastern European or something like that. So he got to, uh, he gave me Carol, which I thought was good. And then I said, uh, I'm Trent. So Trent is the trusted person when we do the certificates. Uh, I'm Trent. Nobody's called Trent. <laughs> and then, uh, then I said I was Victor. Victor is another one. And then uh, Bobby, my name is Bobby. I, I hadn't fucked up the courage to call myself Eve. <laughs> I'm Eve. Bobby. I'm Bobby. So I did uh, Bobby. And then it kind of got on to me there. Uh, so I said my name was Malaroy. And you see there's a little smiley face. <laughs> so, uh, so today I, I, didn't, I didn't get a lot of courage. So mine's is, is Bob. Today. Just playing Bob, but uh, that's uh, so big. And, and they kind of call, uh, ah, hi, Bob. And I go, oh, hello. <laughs> <laughs> so that's my Bob. So that's, that's, my, that's my pseudonym in, uh, in Starbucks. Uh, so I did, I said, Eve. I went to get a coffee and I said, I'm Eve. And he put on Steve. <laughs> I'm not joking. He put on Steve. So. So I thought that was really, really unfortunate. Uh, okay, <laughs> I actually got a little tweet uh, from, uh, from Pete Williams. He said they should have called his son Bob, Bob and, and Alice. Uh, I got three boys, so I didn't have a chance to, to call any of them <laughs> Alice. Uh, but uh, so there, there you go. Okay, so we're going to have a look at, uh, at some, some ciphers. So we'll do some fundamentals and we'll have a bit of fun with, uh, with crypto and some of the things <coughs> that we've done in the past. It, it, eases, it, it exercises your mind. I don't know if you've tried the GCHQ puzzle book. Uh, we've done very well in terms of uh, our students winning awards for their crypto cracking. Uh, try and Try and get involved. They're really great fun, and if you win, it's a great thing on your CV. So, if there's a cipher cut challenge coming up, get involved uh, and, and and have a go. Okay, so we're going to going to cover some of the key principles involved. Uh, so, so <laughs> ciphers are you could call love and war. Love and war. When do you use a cipher? When do you use secret messages? When you're at war and when you're at love. <laughs> So those, those were traditionally the places that you would use secret uh, messages. You had to hide something from, from someone, uh, so you used a secret code. <coughs> uh, the, the American, uh, 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 the Afro-American uh, slaves used, uh, used a quilt code to hide the map of how to escape. 
So it basically says turn left at the rosebush, go past the lake, and you'll be able to escape. So this was the way that they actually uh, created a secret map that pa passed on, but it had a secret code uh, actually in it. Smoke signals are what we would call encoding. Okay, so there's a difference between encoding and ciphering. So ciphering normally involves a key. It's that's the secret key. Encoding involves taking one format and converting it into another, but it's not a big secret. Okay, it's not a there isn't a secret involved. Everybody knows. If you know smoke signals, you'll probably know what the message actually is. So there's nothing secret in it. Microfiche has been used in the past, where you can shrink documents down to small. <coughs> and the Navajo uh, uh, Native Americans uh, were, were used in the, in, in the, the Second World War uh, in Japan. And the, the language that they used was so difficult to decipher that I don't think it was ever, ever cracked uh, from, from them. Okay, so this is the first model that we have. Uh, there's Bob and Alice. I need to try and get an Alice uh, one, so I'll, I'll try and get one, but I don't think I'll get away with that. And then we have Eve in the middle, and Eve is the, Eve is the, is the cracker. So what could Eve do? Fundamentally, what is Eve trying to achieve? Possibly. She wants to intercept the message shared between Bob and Alice. Yes, she wants to intercept it, she wants to read it. That's, that's good. Anything else? Change it. She wants to change it, of course she does. Uh, so she wants to be a proxy, maybe, or she wants to get in between and modify I love you, so I hate you. So that's. Kind of different sentiments in there. Anything else? <coughs> so we use encryption for that. We keep things secret. But encryption isn't just about uh, privacy. What else might you do? She might pretend to be Bob. And do we trust anything on the internet? No. <laughs> so how do we know that Bob sent the message? How do we know that Alice really received it, and Alice read it, and so on? Uh, so encryption focuses on, uh, on, <coughs> on uh, identity checking, and also on integrity checking. So it's privacy, integrity, and uh, identity. That's the three things that we're really focusing on. People just think it's to do with privacy, but, but, but it's to do with those other three things. Okay, so there's the, we can have a, a secret encoding method and a secret decoder. We create <coughs> some sort of cipher and Eve watches it and she knows what's going on there. I don't, I, I don't see what, what that is. So it's been, ciphers and coding have been around for a while. So Morse code was one of the first uh, created and it uses dots and dashes in the days that all we could do is to send little pulses uh, along the line. Uh, so that's the cipher there. You find that the that the the, uh, the most popular letters are the small code, and then the least popular ones, such as this one, actually have a, a longer code. So that reduces the amount of time it's going to take. You need a little pause between, but you'll be able to to, 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 to type code. Does that, can anybody decode this one? I think it's new and new FC. So this is Newcastle United Football Club. You can buy it on the website. Uh, I, I don't expect many people going along to a Newcastle United football match. You know, if you've ever seen one, it's the ball got black and stripes. <laughs> There's one guy with his with his t-shirt with Morse code on it. Look, 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 look what that says. <laughs> 
That says I love you as a bracelet, just in case you're going to get someone a bracelet. It's so sad to get somebody a Morse code bracelet. <laughs> you gave me a Morse code bracelet? Are you joking? Sorry. Uh, so so that, that's, uh, that's, that's one of the ciphers. And it's been around for a while. Uh, uh, Polybus used is the grid, where we can create the grid. Uh, these codes should work, but, but I don't think they do. If you try your phone against them just now, uh, I don't think they do. For some reason, it doesn't, it doesn't work. But it should work on the slides. Uh, all of these are online if you want to give them a try. Okay, so that's just a grid that we create. Obviously, there's 26 letters. So one of them we overload with two letters. But our eyes are the best cipher cracking infrastructures that have been created. You can really spot when something is wrong. You can start to see patterns uh, emerge that would be really difficult for a computer to, to see. Okay, so, so that's that. <laughs> that's that. And, oops. Okay, and then uh, the graphical codes are, are, are one of the best because they're easy to remember and you can write them down and you can hide them in various things. So this is the pig pen code or the Freemason cipher and it, <laughs> it's actually used uh, here. This is a real headstone that actually has a cipher on it. Uh, this is James uh, Reason's uh, tombstone and it has a cipher on it in there. And it basically derives from, you take a letter such as an N, it's that shape and it's got a dot. Can anyone see what they Cipher is there. First letter. H. H. Not this one. Yeah. Oh, you're looking at the headstone. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Is that? Is that? Oh, you. <laughs> <laughs> Your faces were burnt out. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 honestly, you, you were burnt. I'm so sorry. Okay, let's restart that. I'll edit it. <laughs> okay. This this code. Here, <laughs> not, not the headstone. Everybody get that one? Can you get that one? This, this one. What is it? Dig it? No. Uh, no? No, 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 no. Where are you getting R? Where are you getting R from? <laughs> this one. Yeah. Oh, forget for that one. It's this one. Oh, Go for that one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cut. Okay, let's let, let's oh, pretend. Napier. Okay, then. For the cipher in the green and then the, the coding <laughs> above it, okay? And not looking at this one here. <laughs> Quickly, what Napier. does that cipher say? Napier. Okay, that's good. This is Napier because that's an N. And you're right, that, that's not right there. That's an end <coughs> from, from them. Okay, so, so that's a good way of uh, creating it. It's really simple to actually create the, the code. Uh, in, in there. <laughs> and it was used in the, in the, uh, the First World War. Uh, so this is a, a German code that was used. Uh, there is an online game. I keep getting emails from people. It is written on a wall somewhere in a game. Anybody know what that game is? Okay, I'll find it for you. It's written on a wall, and I keep getting emails about, can you, they take screenshots of the wall, because they need to get into the, into the, into the place. <laughs> and it's this code here. It goes by the lovely name of ADFGVX code. There's a bit more to it than that, but if you're interested, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, on, it's online. And then, uh, so they, they're okay. Those types of ciphers, if you keep a secret, then it will only be a secret for as long as, as it takes to crack 
the actual method, the algorithm that they actually use. So we get the concept of a key. And with a key, a key, what we have is a keyword. So in this case, we've got Napier uh, uh, Uni is the keyword that, we're, that we've agreed. Uh, and then we write the letters out without repeating them, and then put the letters back in uh, as, as they are. And it'll scramble up the, uh, the cipher. So then what we do is that we take two letters at a time, and then we bind, we bind, so if it's a P and an S, we bind them together in a square, and we take the two opposite uh, values from there, and then that gives us our, our cipher there. So in this case, we've got attack there, and that <coughs> E and a T go there, and we end up with a M uh, there. Okay, that's the, the outer bound. There's a few other little rules to it, uh, but that's the, that's the basics of, uh, of the, of the Tafier cipher. Okay, so what does that say? That's a really smart way to, 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 to solve this quickly. Uh, thank you. No one can teach you how to do ciphers. You need to think your own method. So don't let anybody tell you how to solve a cipher. Think well. Let, think well. Yeah, so let the natural ability to see patterns. Tell me the quickest way of looking at that and to find the answer. <coughs> Without even checking. It's a double letter at the end. Yeah. So there we go. <laughs> and that's the only one there. <laughs> so the smart money is on is on is on that. So try and try and get your natural child instinct for things. Because we kind of taught you methods and techniques and stuff like that, and we kind of battered out that creativity and ciphers. Try and get that natural Childlike ability back again, because you're going to have to find a needle in a haystack in security. <laughs> in fact, a pinprick on the moon, a pinprick on the Milky Way, and you're going to have to try and find that little thing, that that one little hack that happened here, you dropped something on your on your system, and it's a, it's one little message, and, and that's it. So try and develop that natural ability that that, that you have in there. Okay, so, uh, so that's, <laughs> that's our, our ciphers in there. So as I said, love and war is, is where it's used. Uh, and for love, Caesar uh, was one of the first uh, to use a cipher. It seems a crazy cipher now. It's the kind of cipher that we did at school. Uh, but it, <laughs> at the time, it was an uncrackable cipher. Again, all it did was to move the letters by a certain amount uh, from your plain text. So can someone read that message? So normally uppercase is cipher and lowercase is, is, is plain text. Hello. Hello. Yep. Yeah. It says hello. Okay, so a K is an H, an H is an E, <coughs> and, and so on. So is this a secure code? Have we found the best cipher ever? How many ciphers are possible? <laughs> we'll say 25. Because <laughs> it'd be really bad if you picked that last one. <laughs> I'll never think of that one. <laughs> Why not move it in no letters at all? I'll never see that one. They're trying all these things. It's just not working. The guy comes up to you, but that says a message. No, no, it's a Caesar code. Just let me get it. I'll try again. <laughs> so there's 26. So it's not not exactly the uh, it's not exactly the most secure uh, code. And this guy here uh, was one of the one of the uh, uh, most extreme uh, people. Uh, probably the last place you want uh, a terrorist to get a job is a software engineer in, uh, in British Airways. <laughs> not, not a good place, and he was uh, he was he was he was one of the the uh, so he he refused to use PGP he refused to use PGP for storing these messages, and uh, he because he thought that uh, 
the, the non-believer, it was the cipher of the non-believers. Uh, you actually find now that, that terrorists are using three Ts. Does anyone know what three Ts are? I bet you didn't think you'd get asked that today. <laughs> the three Ts of a, of a terrorist. Three Ts of a terrorist. What, what are the three Ts that a terrorist would use these days? What messaging system are they likely to use? Telegram. Telegram. Telegram, yeah. yeah. Uh, the other T. T <laughs> letter word. <laughs> Completely anonymizes everything. Oh. Where you are. Tor. Tor. Does anyone know the last one? <laughs> like an animal has it. A cat has it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, you did well there. Like, uh, good. Uh, pause. No. <laughs> uh, Tails. So Tails is a, is a bootable operating system. Uh, so the, the, the advice was, Paris was to use this operating system Tails and you, you boot it uh, directly and it has encryption built, built in. So that's the three T's uh, there. So he used the cipher code, he used the CESA code and the really investigators were scratching their heads trying to understand what the secret messages were, and then that's found that because he was using that very basic uh, uh, code. Uh, I mean, unfortunately, it was an encrypted folder, uh, but they managed to encrypt that because it was a password. Okay, so this is the biggest problem: 256-bit encryption, uh, and I put a password of QWERTY1 uh, on it, and really, I've just <laughs> taken away all of the. It's what's called entropy and we'll go into it, it's called key entropy. I can use ginormous keys that you'll take a space alien a trillion, trillion lifetimes to, to crack and still not even crack it. But then I stick on a password to protect it and it's gone. Okay, so that's, that's the biggest problem uh, in, 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 <laughs> in the industry just now. Okay, so, so obviously we can prove on that, so it's 20. That's fine. <coughs> okay, so then, then along comes the scrambled alphabet. So the scrambled alphabet, we just we've got all our letters and we just scramble them around. So can somebody tell me the message there? Inkwell. Okay, so inkwell. So how many ciphers are possible here? A lot. <laughs> can we calculate it? Can we? Can, is there a button on the calculator that oh, permutations or combinations is one of those things? Uh, I think it's uh, permutations. Permutations. So it's, it's the number. So that's right. Okay, well done. So it's uh, we have twenty six chances here of a letter, and now we place that. We've only got twenty five. So 25, 24, 23. So you have a button on your calculator that says, does anybody know what it says? It's a big exclamation mark. That's what you want. <laughs> so it's 26 factorial. Is that a big number? Is this an easy code to crack? You think? Oh boy. Oh, we're stuffed. Okay, so <coughs> 26 factorial is that, okay? Best computer in the world? Uh, what the a hash cracker, a, bit, a Bitcoin hash cracker does about one tera hashes uh, a second. So even a tera, so that's uh, that's big, that's a tera up to about here. Even with your best Bitcoin hash cracker, it's going to take you a long time. <laughs> It might take you 400 million years to, to crack that. But it's half as much, okay? So, so that's a good thing. Why is it half as much? You might be lucky, you might crack it straight away. How's it half? Half of that. On average. On average. Well done, okay? So. Uh, exam alert, I'll put a little sign up, exam alert. If you're asked for the average time to crack, 
Remember, and divide by two, or you'll lose a mark uh, from it. Okay, so that's for the maximum time, the time to go through the depth. So, in your Xbox, this is the most amazing cracker. It's a mass coprocessor. Anybody know how many cores are in your in your GPU on your Xbox or your PlayStation? What? Oh, it's about four thousand. <laughs> your processor has possibly got thirty-two. Uh, my iPhone has got four, maybe eight cores. Your GPU has got 4,000. And an NVIDIA card has 4,000 processors in it, all just loving to be able to crack a little cipher and so on. So we'll find that later, that pilot processing is the thing. So that, that things aren't looking good here. That's, that's going to take us an awful long time to go through it. But the English language isn't quite as random as, as we'd expect. The most popular letter is E, the most popular word is the, and, and so on. Okay, so this is just like Scrabble here. Uh, so the letter is worth more in Scrabble if it's, if it's least probable. So what we can do is that we can actually crack our cipher by looking at the frequency uh, of, of the letters. So in this case, there's a cipher here. It's not as difficult to see, but when we look at this, we go along and we look at the, the occurrence and the letter, uh, the letter R occurs 159 times, 10% of the time. So there's a good guess that we think that an R is, is an E. So in this, we can actually go through the cipher and we can actually work out through the probabilities uh, what the mapping is likely to do. We get <laughs> some of the letters are I've got a kind of it depends on much text that we have. So I can take we typically have to to, to look for key words uh, within inside our, our cipher. I just show you uh, a cipher here. So I'll just uh, make a little cipher. So we'll look at uh, okay. So this is a scramble cipher. Uh, so already you can start to see patterns. Okay. So so there's a the. Well, not well, possibly. <laughs> so we've got three letter ones. We've got two letter ones. There's another two letter one. There's another two letter one, and so on. And look at this little one here. What's that? A or I. A or, or I. That's it. Yeah. So uh, if we analyze the frequencies, so this will get. So tell me what an, what an, what an, what an E is <laughs> in, in ciphers. What, what is an E here? What a y. A y. So right along here, there's a probability of a Y. There's it in our cipher, so it's likely that the Y is uh, that an E is, is a Y, okay? And then we can then look. So the most popular one letter is an A or an I. There's 105 L's in there. So tell me what an L is. An L, an L is an E. Thankfully. And I think we saw that an E, an E, where was it? A Y and an E. Okay, so anybody want to do another little guess? G is a T. So a G and T, that's good. So G is a T. And what else? Is P and H. G and H. And, and so on. Okay, so you see the this are not coming through. Uh, they're at the, that's come through. Uh, 
and then we would typically go through it like that to be able to find so this one here. There's an O. I mean. I know it's an O. <laughs> no. <laughs> I know it's an O. Yeah. And it starts. It starts to to to, to fall out. So we can use the probabilities. But your eyes. Uh, uh, so this could be a D or an S. Uh, an X is. So, okay, so I reckon it takes you five minutes. Okay, I want to do the five minute challenge tonight. Uh, in the video, I take six minutes, but I'm recording it. <laughs> I'm under stress. So, in this video here, I do it in six minutes and a half or something like that. So, I'd like you to do it in five minutes if, if you can at home uh, t tonight. Uh, and then. Okay, so that's that's the that's uh, that's frequency analysis, and we use it a lot in in, a, in our in our ciphers to crack into deeper patterns and, and so on. So another one that uh, that we have that was created is called the, the, Vish, the Vishnu code <laughs> cipher, and uh, with this one, what we have is a keyword again. And we move the, the alphabet. So, so rather than the problem that we have is that we've mapped the same letters to the output so we can match them. So with this cipher, <laughs> we will move the, the rows down uh, until, we find, until we find the row and we take the match. Uh, unfortunately, this was cracked by a Polish cipher uh, person by actually looking at the at the, the frequency of the occurrences, uh, just going to try and find where that, that is. Uh, I'll show you an example of cracking it. Uh, this is my cracker. Right. So it looks pretty much uncrackable uh, as it is, but what it does is eventually, 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 it will start to repeat. So characters will start to repeat uh, on it. So what this chap did, well, uh, uh, Kaczynski, uh, what he did was that he looked at the, at the frequency of the occurrences and from that you can predict the size of the key and uh, it actually works pretty well. So I've used a, just a BB here for the key but you can actually see that, that, that you've managed to, to crack it. So there's a little Python code that's in the tutorial today if you want to give that a try uh, out. But uh, it's not too difficult to break that, that type of, of cipher. Okay, so then we get, we go, we just jump through the letters and then that takes us to our, our cipher. If you really want security, then the, the only way to do it is what's called a one-time pad. So with a one-time pad, you have a code book, and Bob and Alice share it. The problem you've got is how you send the, the code book to Alice, because Eve might be listening. So with that, we now have the same code book. We're not going to use it once. We generate our cipher. We look up the cipher, send it, and, and then Alice looks up her little table. It's often been done with books. Have you ever seen go to go to page 53, line 10, and the first letter there is the first one, and so on. So that's the way that you can actually send sort of secret messages uh, to them. If you want to hide the probability of each of the letters, what you can do is give each of the letters more, uh, uh, more codes. So in this case, an E has lots of codes. And if we look at the probability altogether, it probably evens out. So the next time an E occurs, it's a different code. And a different one in, in there. So you can look at the actual uh, values and they should come out an equal frequency from them. Okay, so what we'll do is we'll have a break for just five minutes and then we'll do some base 64. Right, okay. Well, we all returned mainly, so, so that, that, that's a good thing. Okay, don't be too frightened uh, by the stuff we're going to do. It's really the foundations and, and uh, we're really trying to learn what it is. So the first method that we're going to look at is encoding methods. So encoding methods isn't a secret. 
everybody knows what we're encoding and how we go about it. So there's no, there's no key involved. Uh, it's just a way for us to be able to convert something in binary into a text format uh, that, we, that we can use. Okay, so this is our typical sort of process that, that we might go through. So there is our, our text, our plain text. <coughs> we then put it into some sort of encryption. And then at the end of it, we end up with uh, our cipher stream. Okay, we'll come back on to what the cipher stream means. But we typically take a block at a time and then we encrypt it. We take another block and we encrypt it and so on. But we're ending up with this here. <coughs> Unfortunately, that contains, if you were to display that, it contains non-printable characters. Uh, so we must convert it into a format that we can view, that we can tell people. We can send an email to say, here's your key, that's what it is, and then copy and paste that into your device and so on. So encoding allows us to go from this format into something that's more human uh, ready. And the two main formats that we use is hexadecimal and, and base64. A core fundamental thing, you need to understand hex and base64. <laughs> okay, so hex it likes to keep things nice and simple. It basically takes your, your bit string uh, and then chops it into four bits at a time. And then all we need to do is to count up to 15. So that's really great. I, I know it's easy to count up to nine and do that bit, but then we've got to remember that 10 is an A. So using base 16 here, it's a much better format for converting base two into something that's recognizable. So in this case, we take that one as a five, a one and a four. Second one, is it? Everybody see what the conversion is there? If I was to say one, zero, one, one, what's that? Uh, oh, B. <laughs> so, is that a B? What, what's it in, in, in decimal? It's 11. 11. It's an 8. It's an 8, a 2, and a 1, which is 11. Okay? So it's 11, and you go 10 is an A, so it's B. Okay? So, so try, try to do it in your head. Uh, the calculator you have has got a hex button on it. So don't worry, uh, you know, your calculator will do it for you anyway, but try to get into the way of actually converting it uh, uh, yourself from, from now. Okay, so that's a convenient way for taking our, our bit stream. The other way, and the, the uh, popular way, if you've ever been sent a digital certificate or a key or some cipher, if you ever looked at a cipher email that hasn't been encrypted, looks a bit like, well it doesn't look like that, but it's got lots of... Uh, characters in it. It's what's called B64. 64 characters is enough to represent six, six bits. So we take six bits at a time, we look up the table, and then we map it. So in this case, can somebody tell me what that value is? Off the top of your head. 011001 is a... <clears throat> A one, what was it? Uh, it's yeah, yeah, 25. 25. Okay, a 16 and 8 and a 1 uh, gives us 25 and then that, that's it. We need to get four characters that needs to fill 32 bits at a time. So if we can't fill, we fill with zeros or we fill with equal signs at the end. So the way to spot <coughs> B64 is often that there's a few equal signs at the end. There's one or two. Is it always the case that there's equal signs? No. So we might just be lucky that there is, uh, there is enough bits to stop there. Uh, uh, sorry, <coughs> if there's enough characters to fill there. So it's not always that the equal signs uh, will, will actually be in there. Okay, so with base 64, we take that. Has anybody heard of base 58? That sounds a bit crazy to me. Where, where do you think you'd... Anybody seen base 58? So this is a this is the wacky world of Bitcoin. So uh, so this is the conversion here. I've got a little calculator online that takes you through uh, the sort of conversion from uh, from one one to, to another. But uh, base 58 comes from the crazy world of uh, Bitcoins. 
So if I was to send you a Bitcoin, or not really a send, but if I, if, you were, if I was to buy something from you and give you some Bitcoins, then I send you my ID. My ID is a base 58 uh, uh, string of my public key. Uh, it's base 58 because they've missed out a couple of the letters. So a zero and an O get confused. I don't know when you're looking at it, you get confused. So base 58 has actually taken out a, a zero, the I, and a zero and, and an I. And we end up with 50, 58 letters. So if you ever see a Bitcoin address, it will look something like that, but there won't be an, an O uh, actually uh, in it. Okay, that, that's the basic theory behind it. There's the, there's the Python code from, from there. And if you're really interested, I've got a little outline of that uh, from, from there. You actually find that base 58 is a real hodgepodge of mangled crypto and bits and pieces of this and that. But it's kind of works, and, and, and it does it does work. Uh, okay, so that's that's our that's uh, base fifty eight. <coughs> okay, the other thing we really need to keep things so simple, so simple that if I've got the magic key, I can I can encrypt your message in an instant. If I don't have it, it's going to be so difficult for you to, to actually find it. Okay, so we have a whole bunch of keys. If we make sure there are trillions and trillions of keys, it's going to take somebody a long time to try each of the keys to actually find it. But if I know the secret, oof, I've got the key, there you go, it's, it's encrypted. So we keep it really simple, and then we use the exclusive bar as a very simple logic operator. There's no concept. Remember when you did binary addition and you had the carryover of the bits and stuff like that? Forget about that. <laughs> we don't do that kind of stuff in crypto. Everything is just two bits at a time and we operate on them and there's no carryover or anything like that. So the Squid's for gate is the most basic and it's a great it's a great gate, it's a great function because we never lose anything. It's a magic function if we used or or and we'd lose lots of information. We use exclusive R, and it's all it's all there. Nothing we can hide. Okay, so with an exclusive R, a zero and a zero gives you zero and a zero gives you zero. <coughs> so a zero exclusive R, but a zero gives you zero. A zero X R one. It's a bit like an adder gives you one. A one exclusive or zero? One. And one exclusive or one? Zero. zero. And forget about the carry. <laughs> okay? Forget about the carry. It doesn't happen. Okay? It's gone. It's finished. So exclusive or we just deal with bits. And that's, we create chips. Uh, there's some amazing crypto. XT is one. Have a look at that one. My God, is that fast. Uh, and it's a very simple operation. It's using shifts and exclusive ors. This is what we do in crypto. We mangle it up. We exclusive or something with something else, and then we scramble it, and then we exclusive or it again. We go through the series rounds, and then out the end is a mangled mess. <coughs> okay, one and a zero gives you zero, one and a zero gives you one, and then so on. The other operator that we use is a rotate. We, we call it shift, but it's not really shift. In normal coding, a shift means that the bits fall off the end. When we shift, the bits go out, or if we shift that way, they all fall off the end. Uh, that's not good in crypto, because we're going to lose something. So in crypto, we rotate. We rotate left, and then the bits fall off the end, and then come back in the other side, and we go the other way. Okay? So a typical crypto function is rotate, rotate left two, it scores a bar with one, one, and then uh, rotate right four. Then another end, we rotate left four, we exclude the bar with one, one, 
I can't remember what I said first, but we'll do the opposite, okay? So we do the, the reverse of what you did, and then it'll come back out there. Okay, so there's the two basic operations that, that we have. The other one that we have, remember at school they lied to you. They said, uh, five divided by two doesn't happen. <laughs> and then they tell you, oh, well, it is, it's got a, a remainder. But forget about the remainder. So five divided by two is what? Two. Remainder one. Remainder one. Okay, and we've got, let's forget about that. Let's convert it to a fraction. In crypto, we're not really interested in that, that first bit. <laughs> we couldn't care less about what the division is. What we're more interested in is the remainder or the mod uh, operator. And it's really the remainder of the division that we have. Okay, so 143 mod 5 is 3. What's 87 mod 9? So there is a button in the calculator, so don't worry. 6. Six. 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 Nine. 6. We've got a consensus here. 6. <coughs> is it? I believe you, 81. That's right, yeah. So it's, so it's 6. <coughs> so the mod operator is used extensively in, in crypto, and it's an important uh, operation that, that, that we have. And it's all to do with prime numbers, as we'll, as we'll find out. Uh, the other thing that we have is that uh, we've got lots of different formats that we have for things. Uh, we created the first codes had five bits in them. They had five bits because the, the punch card tape <laughs> couldn't take six, six holes in it. So it had a five bit uh, code. Then they came up with seven, uh, and then it was eight. Uh, but now that's not enough characters, so we typically use 16. Okay, so your interpretation of your bit stream will depend on how your characters are saved, what the, what the country code is, and so on, and how many bits that you're using. Okay, so it could be in decimal, it could be in uh, UTF. Uh, ASCII is the lower eight bits of a UTF, so it's quite nice. We can still see our character, but now they're, they're much bigger. Hex, octal, and then uh, if you want HTML, or like that. Okay, so let's have a look at <coughs> cryptography and it's us against machines. So what we want to make sure is that we can, we can crack things, we can uh, decrypt, but the machine finds it really difficult. So there are two main puzzles that uh, we give that, that computers don't really like that much. Either we have lots of something, or we give it a puzzle that it doesn't like. And it hates, it hates to find out the two prime numbers that are involved in that calculation. That's a really difficult task for a computer. Even though it's got all the list of prime numbers, it's got to search through and keep trying each one until it finds it there. So if it does find that, then it's cracks uh, RSA. Uh, so the so the num the numbers that we've got just keep getting bigger uh, all the time. The other thing we have is that we have lots of something. If we can have lots of keys, then it's more and more difficult for the computer to search through all the keys that are, that are possible. Okay, so we'll come back onto this, but uh, <laughs> what we do in <coughs> RSA is that we take two prime numbers, take one away from them, multiply them, and then uh, we end up with a value at the end. And what the computer's got to do is to try and find that the two numbers that, uh, that are multiplied together uh, to give that. So, so I've got an example of that. I hope I can find it here uh, in terms of description. So I can find it. Okay, so this is my little online cracker here. So it factorizes uh, values. So this one here looks pretty big. But actually, it doesn't take too long uh, to find the, 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 the two the, the values that, that were. Uh, actually involved. So there's one there. And we can actually factorize it to find the, the numbers that, that are involved. So 
Well, as we'll find, the, the core of RSA is that, is that protection of the two prime numbers uh, together, uh, and for us not to be able to find that, but we'll look at that next week. Another concept that we have is what's called the greatest common denominator. And the greatest common denominator is the largest value that will divide into the value that, that we actually, the two values that we actually have. Okay, so with uh, 42 and 50, 56, uh, the factors that go into both of them are 2 and 14. So 14 becomes the greatest common denominator. Can everybody determine the greatest common denominator of 12 and 30? 6. 6. Yeah. So 2 works, uh, 4 doesn't work, so it's 6. <coughs> and what we're often focusing on is to have a greatest common denominator of 1. Because we'll find that when we look at RSA, we've got to make sure the two numbers that we pick are have not got a common factor between them. So then also in crypto, we don't deal with normal numbers, we deal with big integers. We deal with 1,024 bits, 2,048, and now 4,096. These are massive numbers. So this is 240. <coughs> 2 to the power of 240 is that. And we double, 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 double. <laughs> You keep going on from 1,024, and that's a ginormous number. I mean, it will go from here to probably the end of the Milky Way. That, that's a pretty long uh, number. So we need to deal with these large numbers. So there's, there's 2,048 bits uh, integer. In, in there. So we'll just have a look at what uh, OK, so on. Uh, in C Sharp and Java, we've got to bring in special libraries to deal with numbers. We convert them into kind of strings because they're so big we can't hold them as bits anymore. Uh, in Python, though, we don't. Python, you can still use your numbers and you can do 2 to the power of 1024 and it will, it will do that calculation for you. So, so Python is really set up to the big integers. So you can actually see the bigger that we get the larger the numbers. So there's 2048. You see that's a massive, massive number. And we can't do proper mathematics on that, those types of numbers. So we use what's called modulo 2 uh, uh, maths. And with that, we can do all our calculations, but just use exclusive orders and shifts and, and mods and, and, and so on. OK, so that's, that's, our, that's our big, that's our big numbers. And then we have uh, in crypto, we've got to generate things like a, a new encryption key. Uh, so we need some way to randomize, to be able to, to create uh, something, a key that nobody can guess. So if somebody guesses what key I'm going to pick next, they could crack the code or at least have a, a good guess. So we have what's called pseudo-random numbers, which aren't real. The computer is just randomizing something to try and find it's using the method. Uh, pseudo randomization every time I run the program, I get the same random numbers. Uh, some software developers don't understand that, that actually it's pseudo random so that they'll eventually repeat, and also that every single time I run it, it's giving me the same uh, sequence uh, in, in there. So, in pseudo random numbers, we use that typically in, uh, in, in gaming and simulation and modeling because we know that we're always going to get the same uh, each time. But if you are playing the lottery, you want true randomization in there. Does anybody know a true random uh, number generator, true, true sources of randomness? Measuring the time between decay and radioactive yeah, isotopes? That's, that's one, yeah. Uh, the noise that's created in an electronic circuit is one, like a resistor. If you measure the noise levels, that's completely random. That's used a lot. Any other ones that you want to? <laughs> Not expected you to answer this one. Have a little look. 
Uh, you make a lot of money if you can create a, a true random number generator. It's a big problem uh, in, in, in the industry. Okay, so we create a randoms and they look a bit like that when you look at your keys and so on. You'll see these random numbers uh, appearing. Okay, so that <coughs> that's our, our randomization dips that we get in there. Uh, another example uh, that you see quite a lot in the industry is what's called a CRC 32 check. It's just a little value that, that determines the validity of a message. So in this case, the quick brown fox. Why do we use the quick brown fox? Don't sort of the lazy dog. That seems a bit easy. It's got all the letters in it. It's got all the letters in it. Does anybody know any other ones? It's okay. It's okay. I'll, I'll, send, I'll send, send you some. But there, 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 are, there are other ones. CRC is used, it's a basic check, so it's, if any of the letters were to change or anything added, then it won't give you the same CRC. It's really quick. It's not crypto, but it's really quick. So we don't always have to get uh, crypto in, involved in, in them. Okay, so let's dismiss ciphers and let's say that it's not going to work because Eve can find out what the algorithm is. So what we're going to focus on really is the usage of keys. So <coughs> what we need is a method that Bob and Alice create the same key, create the same key, and they can uh, lock something and then open it back up. The fundamental problem is, is that how do they pass the key? We'll come back onto that when we look at key exchange. But the, the fundamental thing is how we get the key. We create the same key between between Bob and, and Alice and them. Okay, so what we're going to look at is the three main methods of, uh, of uh, key-based encryption. <coughs> the truest form of definition, and I'll talk about public key and secret key and so on, but the best definition is symmetric key. You just use the same key for encrypting and decrypting. Okay, so that's secret key. Uh, Bob and Alice have the same key. So when they lock, when the same key unlocks. We then have symmetric encryption. Symmetric encryption, we encrypt with one and then we decrypt with the other one. Okay? Doesn't matter which one, just because this one's private, doesn't mean I can't encrypt with that one and decrypt with that one, but they will work. And it's a bit like having a padlock that you can send out to the world. And you say, here's my padlock, go and lock. Go and lock the box, and then you've got the only key that can actually decrypt it. The great thing with that is you can redistribute your padlocks to everybody else. If somebody finds out how to crack your padlock, you send it all out again. It's not really a secret. <coughs> you just advertise it to the world. But you've got the secret key. With bitcoins, people think they've got a bitcoin. Do you not think people think they've got a bitcoin? I've, I've got a bitcoin on my computer. Have you ever heard of anybody saying that? I tell them they've not. <laughs> It's really boring. You've got a key pair. Oh, I want a real coin. Somebody stole my bitcoins. They didn't. They stole your keys. Listen, they've got your private key. Okay, they stole your they stole your bitcoins. It's a big, it's a big, big token thing, and it sits in there. So it's really disappointing. But your bitcoin, you don't actually have anything on your computer. I hate to say it. The bitcoin miners have the log. They know what's been bought and what's been sold. And the only way that you can prove that you were part of that transaction is with your, your private key. Lose that and you're stuck. You've lost all your money. Okay? So, so just, uh, just watch, it. <laughs> watch, watch, watch that one. Okay, so, so then we have uh, eventually, so RC2, uh, there we have the public key. As we're in the home of John Napier, uh, uh, new methods are being created with discrete logarithms, and explain that. Uh, but the, the two main public key ones are prime numbers, RSA, and uh, discrete logarithms, elliptic curve, uh, and so on. Uh, <laughs> they're, they're toast <laughs> if uh, the quantum computer comes along. <coughs> Their history. So a whole lot of people are doing some research. Uh, come along to see uh, Alan Woodward 
uh, from Surrey, uh, the end of March, Wednesday afternoon, so no excuses. I know you're meant to be doing sports, but come up to the locker and listen to a true quantum uh, expert. <laughs> and then at the end, we've got a one-way hash. It shouldn't be possible for you to go back the way from there, so that shouldn't really be possible. And that, mathematically, it's not possible. But how do you crack that? Is it raining outside? Do I see a... What's the methods that you can crack a hash? The brute force? Uh, brute force is one, yeah. A rainbow table. So a rainbow table has got all the hashes pre-prepared. And you just look there and you can find that virtually every password that's ever been created uh, has been hashed already in Google. Google knows the, the model. Okay, so MD5, SHA1, and so on uh, are, 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 are in there. <coughs> okay, so how safe, how safe are our keys? Okay, so let's, let's keep it really simple. So uh, we create a key, and it's got a notch, or it hasn't. Okay, so it's got four notches, and they either exist or they don't. How many keys are possible? How many? 16. 16. Okay, and then they are. Okay, you, you might be really unfortunate and get that key. Oh, what's that? <laughs> I want that. That's not a valid key. It is. Mathematically, it's valid. I want a key that looks like that. <laughs> uh, so that, that's them all. So 2 to the power of the number of bits that we've got is the number of keys. So the more, the more bits that we have, the more keys that, 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 that we'll get. Okay, so it goes all the way up, and then we go, we've got lots of zeros. So 64 is about there. That's uh, 64 is here. That's 1.8, and then 19 zeros. That's a lot of keys. Does anybody know where we are with cracking keys on the internet just now? Where would you say? If I had a, an N bit key, where would I draw the line as to, if somebody said, I've got a 128-bit key. Would you go to say, yep, that's secure? What do you think the line is drawn just now? For the best crypto machine, which is the internet. So on the internet, people are cracking uh, ciphers just now. Where do you think it might go? Tell me when to stop. Okay, a one bit is crackable. That's kind of obvious, isn't it? Okay, then we'll stop. <laughs> this is getting interesting. We're going to put a wee bet on this one. I put a wee bet on the other one. Put some money against this one. Give you, give you hundreds of one. Keep going. Keep going. Oh. <laughs> no? Okay. How about some money? I've got some cash here. Got some money. I'll give you hundred one. Okay. Where do you think they are? Does somebody want to take a guess? Go on, take a guess. Uh, 76. 76. Higher or lower? <laughs> <laughs> what is that? Lower? Higher? 64. 64. 64. Good guess. You should have shut it out for how I passed. I would just go past those ones. 72. 72. 72 is where we are just now in terms of uh, brute force of, of a distributed computer network using harvesting computing power of an internet, 72. So 128 is a double, 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 until you get to 128. That's a, that's a long, that's a long way. That's a long way uh, to, to them. Uh, but, uh, but what we have is that uh, Computing power increases as we as we go through the years. Okay, so there's a there's a brute force calculation. So I, I'll make it I'll make it uh, ten billion per second. Okay, so we'll, we'll take a a good hash cracker and see how long it's going to take us to be able to crack our keys. Did that refresh? Yeah. Okay, so as we go up, then we can see. Up to about here, 64 is taking us 30 years, 
And up here, 96 is taking us a, a very long, very long time. Okay? So if it was 256, it takes 180 a long time. You agree? You're going to be dead. That's, that's for sure. <laughs> I found your message. Space alien comes down. Oh, I cracked it. But you're, a long time ago, you were, you were kind of dead. So that, that, that's, that's not, not, not so good, okay? So, so we can actually calculate, we take 2 to the power of the okay, number of bits, multiply it by the time to check each one, uh, and then that gives us the number of seconds for that. Okay, so that, that, that uh, gives us that. But then uh, what we've got is that uh, we now have uh, our processing. So now what we do is we, we switch on our NVIDIA graphic, uh, graphics card, and we get 4,000 processors, we give them each a bunch of keys, and get them to crack. So now what we see is that it's taken us much less time to, to crack. So something that took us 78,000 years here, uh, we're actually doing 73 years because we're using pilot processors. And you can get pilot processors on the Amazon cloud. Uh, I think it was the was almost full of people cracking ciphers uh, and so on. So there's GPUs you can get as a service in, in Amazon, and they're, they're cracking these types of things. But the other thing that we have is that we also have uh, increasing, increasing computing power each year. So Moore's law says that you double. Does anybody know Moore's law? What, what does Moore, what did Moore say? Transistors uh, double every 18 months. 18 months. And almost computing power has went the same uh, type of way too. If we approximate as double computing power, then something that took us 292 years actually within 20 years takes us uh, four, uh, four hours. And it's kind of strange that uh, uh, Ron Rivest at the time when he published his uh, uh, method, actually said that, that the factorization involved in RSA would take four quadrillion years uh, to crack. But if you take half and half and half and half and half, you actually end up with just a few days. So although you might say something is four quadrillion years to crack, after a few years, you actually find that that's decayed to, to virtually uh, nothing. So it's important to understand the increases in computing power in both pilot processing uh, and also in, uh, in, in, in the, the usage of, uh, uh, in, of uh, improvements in pilot processing. Uh, so, so, <coughs> So it's important to understand the, the limits uh, of, of your crypto. But when you say that, also, if you're using a password to protect your encryption keys, although you think you've got masses of keys, you actually find that uh, you've only got a limited uh, set. OK, so that's, that's been a, a brief introduction to, uh, to cryptography. So next week, we'll go into much more detail about uh, RSA and uh, uh, the, the different methods involved. The lectures are online. If you could have a little look at them beforehand, just if you've got any questions in the lecture. Uh, does anybody have any questions now about what we're going to look at, uh, what your concerns are with cryptography uh, just, just now? Any questions at all? Yeah. <clears throat> Notwithstanding the content of this uh, next few lectures, I mean, does cryptography have a future? Uh, in the sense that, you know, if, if the time to crack code ever diminishes, then, you know, at some point our code cycle are in practical terms useless. So, so the crypto that we have is the crypto that was developed 20, 30 years ago. The crypto for the future will be. Uh, different. So the methods that we've used are fine just now and will, will be fine for the next decade or two. 
but there are new methods called homomorphic encryption. Homomorphic allows me to create a cipher of a value, you to create a cipher, and if I want to calculate the total, I can take the two ciphers together and then I can calculate a value. So that allows you to store data in the cloud and everybody can have access to it. Uh, there is also new things to do with uh, zero knowledge proof. We give away our identity all the time, every single time we log in. So there are new methods that allows you to prove yourself without actually revealing anything about yourself. So it's likely that the old methods will go and the new methods will come in. Uh, if, if anything, cryptography is going to become ubiquitous and everyone, every company will be forced to use it. So the carrot has it what? Uh, so my ISP still tells me that QWERTY11 is a good password. And I've tweeted them, I've posted blogs, and it's still not changed. So you really worry that when Adobe was hacked, there was two million people who used the password one two three four five six. They didn't use salt. So once you crack that, you crack it for two million uh, people. So if anything, things are going to increase because fines are, are going to be there for, for, for companies. And, and auditors will get much more tech savvy. And an auditor will actually ask if you're salting your password and how it's actually. Well, that's going to introduce legacy problems in the same way that people you know, eventually have to sort of convert old tapes or old disks into a modern form. I think and eventually the old codes will need to recode them. So with the GDPR, companies will be forced to, to, to move personal data away from your non-personal data. And that's a, that's a big jump in the industry because everybody's used to creating a database with just with a different table. Uh, but more and more you'll have to you create a firewall between personal information and the other information and it becomes quite a challenge to actually do that. Every record should be encrypted with its own key because what you find is that most companies, if, if you're an insider, you have access to the private key. So any insider can probably crack a database or actually uh, 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 decrypt things. So there'll be a big change in really the way that, that companies design things. Uh, so there's only there's only a year or two to go before that, that will actually happen. Any any other questions? Good, right, we'll do we'll do a bit of practical stuff in, in the lab.